Colonial Woods Missionary Church presents Keys to Confident Living. morning this morning uh, Colonial Woods how's everybody today beautiful spring morning glad you're here if you have your Bibles take them turn to Matthew chapter 27 and that's where we're going to continue our series called unexpected as we've been on a journey toward the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ we'll go a few weeks beyond that as we look at the unexpected life of Jesus Christ I've been trying to read the Gospels through that lens in fact even this morning when I was reading through the last about 24 hours of Jesus's life um, I was uh, so there were so many unexpected things that happened and unexpected um, uh, words that Jesus spoke and so I'm kind of looking at it with a fresh set of eyes and it's been a good journey for me I don't know how you folks watch TV or movies. I'm a guy who always tries to figure out what's going on. In fact, often those that I'm watching with will say, hey, just relax and enjoy the journey a little bit. But I'm always trying to figure stuff out. I'm always looking for symbolism, always looking for foreshadowing. And I'll often like want to write things down because I don't want to spoil it for the person I'm with because I'll lean over and say, I'll bet you that's the person who did it. And then I ruin it for them. And so I like to write it down just so later I can prove that I knew what was going on. And my wife hates that, by the way. And uh, when we watch uh, TV shows together, a lot of times, especially if it's a main character or a hero, I'll, I'll lean over and I'll say, well, I know this. I don't know. They're in a precarious situation. They look like their life's going to be lost. I guarantee they're going to get out of this. And she'll say, well, why do you think that? I said, because uh, otherwise the whole series would be over, right? Because if the hero dies, this thing's over. And I'm sure there's probably been one of those cases where they had the main character in the first two or three episodes. They killed them off and it just shocked everybody. But for the most part, heroes aren't supposed to die unless they do. And when they do, it just takes me off guard. I don't like it. It's not, it's not the way it's supposed to be. I'm a, I like the Marvel comic movies. I enjoy the Avengers and Captain America and Iron Man and all of those. And uh, I don't want to be too much of a spoiler for you, but as you get to the, the end, the last two um, movies in the series, and you get to Endgame, which is called the Endgame movie or Avengers Endgame, it's amazing how the heroes start dying off, and they're not supposed to. Like, there's this one part where Black Widow and Hawkeye are kind of plummeting to their death, and you just know they're going to get out of it. And then she does, and Black Widow dies, and I remember watching this going, oh, this is not good. I don't like this. I, I was in the movie theater, I'm pretty sure, and leaned over, so I don't like this movie. I don't like it. I don't like it. I, I don't know how to feel about this. And, and when Vision died, twice, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I couldn't stand it, and Again, spoiler alert, you probably should have watched him when they first came out. At the end of the whole series, when Tony Stark, Mr. Iron Man dies, I hated that movie. I, I just was like, I don't, I mean, it made sense, but I, I don't like it. Heroes aren't supposed to die. And if you happen to be reading through the Gospels, and you didn't know the end of the story, and you were reading it like a, a story, I'm going to guess that you'd come to the last few days of Jesus' life. You come to the Passover. He says, this is my body. This is my blood. And again, you don't know the end of the story. You see Jesus arrested, and you're thinking to yourself, he's going to get out of this one, right? Because he's the hero. And you come down to chapter 27, and you come up to verse 45, and I'll bet you, this final scene would be unexpected. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, which would be about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those who were standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. 
And immediately one of them ran to get a sponge and he filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest said, ah, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Luke says that in that final moment, he actually uttered a phrase. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. John says right before that, he said, it is finished. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. And the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion, who was in charge of a hundred Roman soldiers, probably had been with them this entire time, when the centurion and those that were with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely this was the Son of God. Mark specifies and says that it was the centurion that uttered the words, surely this was the Son of God. Luke adds a little bit more into the whole scene. Again, none of them are wrong, just when you hear everybody's perspective, you get a little fuller picture. Luke says that it was Jesus who looked over at the thief on the cross and the thief who had earlier mocked him asked for him to remember him when he came into his kingdom and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. The Gospels indicate that they're gambling, casting lots for Jesus' clothing, specifically the one sewn piece that was his undergarment and Jesus looks down from the cross and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the centurion, the centurion is an individual who had years of service that had a hundred hardened soldiers underneath his command. Likely, was part of the team and gave oversight to the arrest of Jesus. Certainly would have been over all of the soldiers who were taking Jesus from trial to trial. Most certainly the centurion was watching, in fact, probably trained the soldiers under him how to do a proper beating and a flogging and I'm sure that he did a training with them of how to maximize the amount of pain and agony and insult that would take place on the cross. That same centurion who would have been an earshot and witness of all of these things as he surveys the job that his guys are doing, he looks at the cross and says, surely this is the Son of God. Something changed. That's kind of unexpected. You don't expect that guy to all of a sudden have a change of heart. And it's almost like he was staring at the cross and the cross became a mirror back to him and revealed some things. I don't know if you know the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. But you'll remember there was an evil queen who was quite beautiful and she had a mirror. And do you remember what she used to ask the mirror? Do you recall? Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror would go back to her and presumably the mirror can't tell a lie. And so, you know, he would say, oh, queen, you are the best. You are the most beautiful by far. There is no one who compares to your beauty. And this is what he said to her day after day until he couldn't. Because Snow White came on the, sea, on the scene, she grew of age, and now the mirror is saying, well, you're beautiful to be sure, but there's one who's fairer still. And she hated that. She didn't like it when the mirror started telling the truth. And imagine the cross as a mirror. What does it say to you? 
The first thing that it reflects back to me is just simply the dreadfulness of my sin. My sin is ugly. And you'll notice I'm putting in the word my. Please do not think about somebody else in this message. Because nobody looks at a mirror, sees a messed up set of hair, and then goes off and criticizes somebody else's hair. You don't look in a mirror and see that your shirt's not done correctly and then go tell somebody else their shirt's not right. You look in a mirror because you want to see what you look like to speak truth to you. And when you look at the cross, it ought to just speak truth to you. And it ought to reflect the ugliness of sin because sin is ugly. It really is. It's just dreadful. It's horrific. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I know that it's a quote from the Psalms, but in that moment, Jesus, either quoting the Psalm or living the Psalm, feels separated from God. This is the one who is the eternal Son of God. This is the one who has been with God in the beginning. He, it says in Colossians chapter 1, He is the image of the invisible God. He is God in the flesh. By Him and through Him all things have been created that have been created. And in that moment, the one who had never been separate from the Father was now feeling separated. And the reason for it is, is because sin always separates us from fellowship with God. Isaiah 59 says this, and again, make this very personal. He says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. What is Isaiah the prophet saying? God is speaking through him. He says, sin separates. But sin wasn't only a separation. On the cross, Christ became the substitution for us. Because it was our death He took. Uh, Romans chapter 3.23 says, The wages of sin is death. Now i got to be honest with you, this isn't really very fun to think about. But when you think about the fact that we have not only committed sins, but we have sinfulness in our heart that wants to do our own thing, it becomes very personal because when Christ died, He died for me. He died in my place. He took my place. And what's interesting, what's interesting, if you want to do a little study, if you're one of these people who likes to see why things are in Scripture the way they are, everything, let me give you a hint. If you have a hard time reading the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament is supposed to point forward to Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't pointing back to everything in the Old Testament the Old Testament is supposed to point forward to Jesus Christ. And in Leviticus chapter 16, there's something really interesting being talked about. It's explained to us. It's the Day of Atonement. The word atonement means at one moment with God. It means to bring two people who are at odds back into relationship. So the word, the Day of Atonement, is how to bring the people of Israel into relationship with God and you have the priest the high priest and before the high priest can even have a sacrifice for anybody he has to have a bull sacrifice for himself just to cover his own sin because he's so unworthy to even do this act and then it says that he is to take two goats and one goat is sacrificed and the other goat remains alive and the first goat is sacrificed and his blood is carried behind into the Holy of Holies whereby he becomes a sin sacrifice for the sins of the people. And then after that sacrifice is done, they take the priest takes some of the blood off of that goat, puts it on the head of the other goat and confesses the sinfulness of the people and then that goat is escorted outside of the city gates by an individual who's been designated to do this job, and he leads him out into the wilderness and sets him free, and it says that he carries the sins of the people into a solitary place. Why? Because sin separates us from God, and the holy God cannot be where sin is at. So the goat carries their sin into the wilderness. The goat is called the scapegoat. And the goat that is sacrificed is done in our stead. He's a substitution. And the goat that is the scapegoat is separate 
and he carries us into a solitary place and Jesus Christ becomes both of those for us on the cross. And it's personal. If I'm standing in here all by myself, I'm preaching to an audience of one and it applies. Because this is personal. So when I think about the stuff I've done in my life, like steal a tape from my church and have to deal with that, or the stuff I've dealt with in my life that I've thought about, or the things I've done that maybe I don't want anybody to know. In fact, one of the things I often say to people, <laughs> just to kind of throw them off guard, what's the one secret thing you've done you hope nobody will ever know? <laughs> they always hate it when I ask that question. Because God knows it. Um, I'm going to take you to a passage of Scripture in Isaiah 59 or 3. I'm going to read it out of the PPPP version. Uh, it's the Pastor Phil paraphrase personalized version. It's a new version just coming out. Uh, this is the first one <laughs> that I've done. Uh, what I did, I often do the Pastor Phil paraphrase, but I, I made it personal, and I, 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 think, I think the Lord would be okay with it. Surely He took up my affirmities. And he carried my sorrows. Yet I considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But see, he was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. The punishment that brought me peace was upon him. And by his wounds, I am healed. You see, I was like a sheep. I've gone astray. I wanted to go my own way. And the Lord has laid on him the ugliness of my sin. You know, when the centurion looked at the cross, I don't know what he was thinking, but if it was a mirror, I wonder if he saw the ugliness of his sin. When I look at the cross and I look at it as a mirror, it begins to speak something else to me, and it's just simply the desperation of my sin. Because if I'm going to un understand how hard this is, it's going to speak to me of just how unworthy I am, how I could never do this on my own. Notice what it says if you move backwards into, into Matthew and you go to verse 27. It says, when he, released, when he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. We rush right through that statement, right? I mean, he was flogged and he was crucified. And you know what? It's the lunch hour and we've only got so much time to think about this. And so we rush past it, right? That's just what we do. Because we assume when we read it, it took what? Five, ten minutes to do this? This was anywhere from nine to eighteen hours in process. He was on the cross for nine hours. He was in trial since the night before. Notice what it says they did to him. They stripped him. Why? Because they always stripped him. Historians tell us that when a person was crucified, they didn't die just from the pain. They died from the shame. Because historians indicate most individuals were crucified stripped naked. I know that doesn't match up to the pictures you've got hanging on the wall because nobody wants to go there. But if they weren't afraid to gamble for his clothes and they weren't afraid to take his undergarment and they weren't afraid to ridicule him. And they weren't afraid to mock him. And they weren't afraid to spit at him. And they weren't afraid to put spikes through his wrists and his feet. If they weren't afraid to do that, why would they stop short of what they'd done with everybody else? And they twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and they mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and they took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again and after they mocked him, they took off the robe. They put on his own clothes on him. They led him away to crucify him. They took his clothes back off, by the way. That's what they were gambling for at the cross. Those who passed by, verse 39, hurled insults at him. Verse 41, 
in the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders, they mocked him. Verse 44, in the same way the robbers who were crucified with him heaped insults on his head. It's interesting, the Romans were perfectionists at pain. Historians tell us that at the end of a, of a short stick or handle would be pieces of rope anywhere from 18 to 24 inches long. They would weave ball bearings or bone shards into the leather, sometimes both. Individual would be bound with his hands around the pole while he'd be stripped down to his buttocks and they would just lay him open. Partly to dissuade others from disobeying the Romans, partly so that he wouldn't hang on the cross quite so long. And as horrible as all of this is, it wasn't the horrificness of Jesus on the cross that paid for our sins. It wasn't how He was crucified. He had to be crucified because it matched up with what Scripture said. By the way, 400 years before crucifixion was invented, David prophesied that's how Jesus was going to die. It wasn't how He died. It's who died. It's who died for our sins. It's what it took for my sins. Because look what it says in Philippians chapter 2. If you want to pop there or just look in your notes, Paul says, Christ Jesus, who was in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but He made Himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. God, Jesus, in the very nature God, equal with God, set that aside and went to the cross for our behalf. I reference Colossians 1, verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth. Do you see who this is? He is the one who's active in creation. Yet, verse 19 says, For God was pleased to have all of His fullness dwell in Him and through Himself to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. You see, it's not what was done to Him. It's who died for us. Because if you got to be perfect to pay for my sins, and someone has to live a sinless life to pay for my sins, and if someone has to be without even a bent towards sin to pay for my sin, I couldn't qualify, you couldn't qualify, no one could qualify. That's why God had to carry it Himself. And I just, I, I don't know, I don't know what the centurion saw but I wonder if, if he saw the ugliness of the stuff he'd done and the desperation of his own soul. But here's what I hope he saw, and I think this is what transformed him, that he saw the depth of God's love for him. Because Ephesians chapter 5 says this, you see at just the right time while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, although for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, when we didn't even know we needed a Savior, before we even knew Jesus existed, Christ died for us. Why? Because God loves us. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. God, verse 17, chapter 3 of John, He says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be rescued, saved. This really is a love story. In fact, it's an embarrassing love story because have you ever, I don't know if you've ever been given something that is so incredible, you're so undeserving, it embarrassed you. 
I mean, it's like going to one of those little Christmas exchange parties and you thought there was a $10 limit. So you buy a Tim Hortons card. That's what I buy every year. $10 Tim Hortons card. Or Starbucks card. I can go either way. And you pick for your gift an Xbox. 550 bucks. What? <laughs> That's not fair. Or how about this? You buy an Xbox, they give you a house. What? And us as husbands, we love to proclaim our love for our brides. Honey, I love you so much that I am going to give a month's salary, a month's wages to buy your engagement ring. I think that's the rule now. It wasn't when I did it the first time. I bought her another one later to make up. <laughs> Honey, I love you so much. I'll spend 30 years with you paying off a house. You know what Jesus says to his bride? I love you so much. I'm going to go to the cross for you. And I, if you're like me, I love the resurrection. I love Easter. I'm the guy who gets up here, oh, for about six months after Easter Sunday, and every Sunday morning I say, every Sunday is a declaration that Jesus is alive. He is not dead. It is a resurrection day. I love the resurrection. But please forgive me. You cannot walk to Sunday until you walk through Friday. And you cannot know the meaning of the resurrection until you understand the mirror of the cross. That's why Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 prays and he says, every time I pray for you, this is what I pray for, that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, to know the unknowable, for you to know something that is beyond your human comprehension, but I want you to experience, I want you to understand, I want you to know a love that goes beyond knowing. Because when you come face to face and you look in the mirror of the cross and you see your ugliness and you see how desperate you are and then right back there staring back of you is the love of Christ saying, I'm willing to carry all of this for you. You can't help but be changed. In fact, the author to the book of Hebrews says in chapter 10 of Hebrews that if you look face to face with the cross and you just keep right on doing the same old things you've always done, it's like you're just crucifying them all over again. And it says the centurion stood there in the shadow of the cross and something clicked. This hardened, non-empathetic, emotionless career soldier said, wow, this really was the Son of God. And I don't know what convinced him. I don't know if it's because Jesus went through all of his trials and accusations and he didn't say anything. I don't know if he was touched by when Jesus was on the cross and he looked down to his mom and said, Mother, here's your son. Son, here's your mother taking care of his mom from the cross. I don't know if in earshot he heard Jesus look at the same guy who had just ridiculed and mocked him and said, Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Or the grace he showed when he looked down at the centurion 
and his soldiers who are just gambling for Jesus' clothes while, he laid, while he's hanging there naked from the cross. And he says, forgive them. They don't, they don't even know what they're doing. Or, or maybe it's in the very last moments of Jesus' life. Because can I just tell you something? By the time you're on a cross, you're not getting off a cross. Not alive. If you find yourself on a cross, you're dying. There are no reprieves. There are no pardons. It's too late. So whoever you really are, whatever you really believe, if you're faking, history says that from the cross, people would scream, the foulest of obscenities. It's who they really were. What kind of mask? Are are you still worried about your reputation? Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I don't know what it was, but something transformed that guy. Unexpectedly. And I would dare say that if you took the time to actually look at the cross, that if you don't, you might know all about Jesus, but if you've looked at the cross and you haven't embraced Jesus, James says you're like a guy who looks in the mirror and when you walk away, you forget everything you just saw. It's not enough to know about Jesus you have to embrace Jesus. And if you're a believer who's here, who you've embraced Jesus, but you're living like you don't know Him, Jesus says that the cross becomes the model of how you're supposed to follow Him. Anyone who wants to follow me, Jesus said, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. I didn't make this up. Mirror, mirror on the cross. What do you say to me about my loss? What do you speak to me about my need? How Jesus died to set me free. What do you say to me about my sin? What do you speak about knowing Him? Jesus, this morning, I, I, it's hard for me to look at the cross, not just to see how horrific it was, but to see you staring back at me. But Lord, I'm, I'm so sorry for how horrific it was. I don't even like to focus on it, but I'm, I'm so thankful that you love me so much you would do anything. You'd carry anything for me to have a relationship with you. So forgive me when I've kind of just quickly looked at what you did for me and it hasn't changed me. And this morning, Lord, I desperately need you and I desperately need to be changed. And forgive me, Lord, when I've looked at the cross and then I just go away. And even as a believer, I've just kept doing the same things over and over again. Forgive me, Lord, when it's like I've been crucifying You all over again. You deserve my full surrender, my full attention. You deserve my entire life. So as the old hymn of faith says, a king of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. 
lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. Thank you, Lord. I'm embarrassed it took so much, but I'm so grateful that you took it for me. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Colonial Woods Missionary Church presents Keys to Confident Living.